migrant or often called economic migrant, migrant is considered to be people who leave their countries of origin voluntarily. And they are considered to be able to return back without problems. Refugees, on the other hand, are people who escape persecution. And that's why they're not, it's not safe for them to return back to their countries of origin. But considering what is going on currently as a result of your European migrant and asylum crisis. We see that the distinction between voluntary and forced migration seems to blur a lot. So in that sense, the assumptions of choice and agency or the lack of these actually is, can be very much questioned right now. So refugee definition is at the intersection of three concepts, very central to modern legal state, modern legal system. So which are state, law, and authority. So refugee is defined as such by the UN Refugee Convention and the UN Protocol. So refugee is someone who has a well-founded fear of persecution as a result of five reasons. Their race, religion, nationality, and membership of a particular social group or political opinion. So this is the definition of refugee. So Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada, which is Canada's largest administrative tribunal, is the central actor that determines refugee status. It basically determines, it finalizes refugee claims that are made in Canada. And it also solves, finalizes migration-related disputes. And it takes around over 25,000 refugee decisions per year. Its decision makers are called board members. So they have authority over, they have jurisdiction over refugee claims, which means they hear refugee claims during an oral refugee hearing and determine if the person qualifies for refugee status or not. So they have limited term political appointees. They're appointed by the governor and council for two to three year terms and they can be reappointed for a maximum period of 10 years. Since the inception of the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada in 1989, they faced constant criticism on their selection, appointment, and behavior. So on one hand, this seems like refugee determination seems like a simple task, or straight, a straightforward routine task in the sense that trying to, trying to implement the refugee migration and human rights law on individual cases, and not so much. IRB is the board, Immigration and Refugee Board, is probably the administrative tribunal which received most negative media coverage in Canada. And most of the criticism focused on the divergence in refugee status grant rates. So the argument is, in Canada, it seems like getting, getting refugee status is the luck of the draw. So the decision maker, who the decision maker is, matters more than the merits of the claim. So if we look at, oh, it doesn't look perfect, but the, the, the table up is, the, is, is from 2012. So I basically chose six decision makers for each year who took more than 50 decisions and decide, who took decisions on similar countries, on, on the same countries of origin, Hungary, Mexico, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Turkey. And as you can see, they have very divergent refugee status grant rates. So Daniel Maxweeney here, for example, he heard a total of 80 claims. He only accepted one, and he rejected 64 claimants on no credible basis, which means he did not believe the claimant at all, which has real consequences for the claimants, which make them removable from Canada to the fee base. So they have no right to Kevin Feinblum here, on the other hand, he accepted around 80% of the claims for two years. So there's a clear puzzle here that why, why is there divergence? Why there are some board members who very rarely grant refugee status, while there are others who actually accept the majority of the claims? So I'll tell you about the dominant explanations <coughs> in legal scholarship and migration studies. And, and I'll tell you why I disagree with them and I, I study this issue differently. So first of all, one 
knee-jerk response to approach this is judicial politics, patronage bravery. We have to look at by who, which, by which political party these people are appointed. But on the other hand, there's a big discussion going on within this scholarship, which says maybe party of appointment is not a good measure to understand ideology or policy preferences. Because both political party in power has to appoint all sorts of people. Yes, they do appoint their partisans, but they also have to appoint people who come who have no political affiliation or people who come from opposition parties. So in that sense, party of appointment may not be a good measure to understand ideology. And on the other hand, there are some board members who are appointed by conservatives or liberals, and they have very divergent refugee status grant rates. And some are are not are, are repointed by different political parties as well. And, it, and the other issue is this argument cannot tell us if the government actually selects among the group of people that they believe is going to going to accept going to take refugee decisions according to the policy preferences of the political party, or actually they tell them what to do. So is it a political patronage or political? And other, in migration studies, another way to look at this is through individual bias or the characteristics of the decision maker, which argues actually we have to look at what kind of decision maker they are and how they actually differentiate on the basis of race, ethnicity, age, or gender of the, of the claimants. And the other argument within administrative law scholarship is that what matters most is the knowledge and expertise of the decision maker. Considering the fact that administrative court judges or adjudicators are not necessarily judges in the classical sense of the term, but people who are considered to be specialists or experts in their domain of expertise, this seems like an interesting argument. But here is what I'm doing. The previous research, especially in social science, psychology, linguistics, and all these different areas, tells us there are many dynamics, in, in, including, in, in, there are many dynamics involved in the education <coughs> process, and it is complex. But very little is known actually how the tribunal works. So I actually adopted a public administration approach to this question, which is a policy implementation approach, which tells us that we have to actually try to understand what is going on in so it gives the analytical primacy to the functioning of discretion. The discretion is often uttered as a word, as if it is this uncontrollable domain of action which we cannot really understand. This scholarship says, no, actually, we can understand discretion. So this means I have to give, I have to give the, the, the primacy to refugee hearing. What is going on in refugee hearing? As well as the organizational context, internal <coughs> decision-making environment. So therefore, as I have already told you, and discretion is not a formless domain of uncontrolled action, but if we actually understand the social context, if we actually study the social context systematically, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see that there, there, are, there are pattern simplifications, which can explain us action. So finally, therefore, the focus. And my focus was on actually how credibility assessments and assessments related to well-founded fear of persecution are made. And finally, how board members actually conceive their role within, within this institution. So very rarely researchers studying state institutions in democratic context will tell you access was an issue for them. But for my case, it was. Refugee hearings are refugee hearings and records are close to the public. Board members are not allowed to speak to public, researchers, or media alike. And finally, a very small percentage of refugee decisions are posted online. So I had to follow a quite dynamic and pragmatic <coughs> research approach. So what I did was after I understood that actually refugee lawyers were important actors. To, to approach to, about 80% of refugee claims are represented by refugee lawyers. So after I learned that, I just showed up at, at federal court hearings, at the IRB, at the meetings of refugee lawyers. 
So it took me some time to convince them to introduce me to their clients, and they did in the end. So thanks to about 13 lawyers, they observed 50 private hearings in Montreal over a period of 18 months, uh, which gave me access to 29 decision makers, 29 board members. So I observed several of them repeatedly, some others only once. So since I was in the field for a long time, 18 months, participating in different activities of refugee advocacy groups and lawyers and all, so I managed to do some interviews as well, and some interviews with, with board members who left the board during that time that I had observed. And finally, I do document analysis of, of the board's confidential documents, such as the training materials used for the board performance measure, measurement materials, or hearing decisions. And especially, it was important, since I did not observe each board member several times, in order to understand what they were doing, if my impression was correct, I, I read several decisions of them. So finally, before I actually introduce you my findings, Obviously, I did not <coughs> discount the importance of how difficult actually it is to navigate the refugee determination system. Despite the, the, despite the fact that administrative tribunals are established on the premise that they are supposed to be informal and very effective institutions and, and easy to navigate, it's not really the case. It's, a, it's an extremely legalistically complex process. And second, Access to counsel and quality of representation is very significant because lawyers do play very important roles in refugee determination. They help from the very beginning with a well-prepared case file, which does not include, which, which removes consistencies, incoherencies, and actually helps with the testimony. And they actually help with obtaining psychological reports, medical reports, or expert testimony expert witness testimony, sorry. And finally, they, lawyers actually prepare the claimants to the hearing. They tell them what is, what is expected of them during the, claim, during the hearing, and how to perform, how to behave, what to wear, all these simple things. So in this example, which I'll just show you one, uh, one citation from a claimant, and as you can see, like this is a very good representative of how difficult it is actually to navigate the system, especially when the claimants does not really have procedural capital, then he will not really appreciate what is going on. And he'll, he or she will have assumptions that how the system will work. For example, he was thinking that he was not supposed to actually give testimony in the hearing. It was his lawyer who was supposed to talk. And, but, but, but he did not see his lawyer several times, so he did not really know what was expected of him. And so he, he clearly, he, he explains it quite well, that when, when, when the board member asked him questions, he, he was continuously nervous. He didn't know what to answer, if he was answering right or wrong. So after that, what makes a difference is among board members, with the, with the high refugee status grant rates and low refugee status grant rates. They are these actually the hearing. What happens of the, at the hearing is the moment of truth. So hearing in the end is an administrative test, right? It's a screening and filtering procedure. That's what happens. So the board members do two things. They do a factual credibility assessment on one hand, and they do a legal assessment. They unpack the category, the categories of refugee definition. So on the one hand, while controlling the proceedings, while presiding the inquiry, the so board members ask themselves these questions. Is the story accurate, coherent, and detailed? So is, it, is it reasonably likely that it belongs to the claimant? And is the claimant telling the truth? But legal assessment-wise, obviously, does the story fit into one of the grounds of fear of persecution? Does it fit the refugee definition? But ultimately, what the board member does is, is a judgment test. Does this person deserve protection? Does this person in front of me deserve protection? And I found board members do these assessments in two very different ways, which I call interrogation and interview. 
Interrogation actually seeks one single truth. So if you're a stu student, I can also explain, if you're social science students, I guess, we can, ex we can also try to understand this as a, as a distinction between positivism and constructivism. You know, in a positivist, we come from a positivist scientific understanding, we seek one single truth that is out there, we're trying to understand it, we're trying to figure it out. But in the interview, on the other hand, we try to seek plausibility, where we actually co-construct what is going on through what is the, the credibility of the claimant. So on the one hand, interrogation actually applies very rigid tests. It is, it is, <coughs> it is more limiting and more bureaucratic. And the, the interview, on the other hand, ha, applies much more resilient tests and questioning. So interrogating board members are required to use yes and no questions, obviously. But the, in, during interrogation, yes or no questions are much more compared to interview. Interrogation demands a chronological account of what has happened to the claimant. In interview, on the other hand, these are everything, details are. And psychology research tells us actually through repeated people, people will remember more. So it's not, but, but for, 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 for interrogation, what has appeared afterwards or during the claim will, will, will look like fabrication. For example, and so in that sense, they expect the, 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 the members who, who, who evaluate the claims through interrogation expect a seamless consistency between the written testimony of the claimant and the oral testimony of the claimant. So otherwise, if, if it doesn't work, it is, it, it, is, it is very likely that it will create disbelief and it will discredit the claim. <coughs> In the interview, on the other hand, the claimant is given much more opportunity to, to explain why there is consistency. And as long as, they explain the, as long as the explanations are convincing for the board member, they will be accepted. And in that sense, it facilitates the claim. In most of, the, in most of my hearing observations, claim, claimants did provide way testimony. They modeled dates, addresses, and sequence of events. But it, it led to very, very different decisions. And again, the quality of the lawyer is, is quite significant, especially as I gave you, uh, as, I, as I told you just a moment ago, how important it is in terms of providing a consistent testimony and how to behave during the hearing. These are two examples, just to illustrate what I am claiming in terms of interrogation and interview. So as you, as you read through this, it's, 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 the red one is obviously the question, the questions are asked by the board member. It's a, it's a claimant claiming that she's escaping, alleges violence from her, her ex-boyfriend. And <clears throat> as you can see, there's, a, there's an inconsistency in the, in the written testimony and what is, what is being told during the oral testimony. So the board member is trying to clarify this issue. If, and she's not, she, the board member is not convinced with the, with the explanation because she expects someone who has a university degree to know the difference between, between the military and the police. And the second example, on the other hand, is a couple from Turkey. They're claiming refugee status on, 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 on race and religion. So I'm here as well. And you see, you see that actually the board member allows the claimant to articulate much more, and why, why something new actually appeared during the testimony, and how how the claimant explains this. So in that sense, these are these are not random actions. Board members do this systematically. They either do interview, they either interview the claimant or they either interrogate the claimants. And this is a this is a way I, I, I argue it's actually a simplification of the complex task task of refugee determination. So they have to find a way which they believe is fair in order to be able to 
respond to the demands of the organization, which asks them to take consistent and efficient decisions. So these distinctions between interview and interrogation actually comes from conceptions, board members' conceptions of their work which are professional duties, what makes a refugee, and best credibility assessment methods. So first of all, I'm going to show you uh, excerpts from interviews that I did with board members. And you'll see how actually th they have different role conceptions. So in this first one, so what is the job of the board member, right? So according to the first group, which were really interrogators who were interrogating, one says actually they have much more rigid and bureaucratic, legal bureaucratic understanding of their jobs. So they, they say actually one can sympathize with the claimant that the law is the law, or it's a strictly legal work, if not, then you have to accept everyone, and that's not, we cannot do this. But according to the second group, actually they do a more comprehensive assessment. Most of them explain to me how they had to read the body language of the claimant to really understand a full sense of the story. For example, this one says, if you do not listen and try to understand the person in front of you, there's no rule of law, there's no human rights. But the next one is, what makes a refugee? Despite the refugee definition, actually, board members have different conception of refugee. So according to this, and, and it's not based on if they have, if they were refugees themselves, or if they were immigrants themselves, even if they had experience in, experience and expertise in refugee law. So one explains how he was a refugee himself, how his parents were Jewish, and they had to leave France to save themselves. And for him, they can tell his story 20 times in exactly the same way, but not, but, but, and he will never contradict himself, because it's a story of his life. But these people, he's referring to the refugee claimants, they're not the same. For him, they arrive here and they tell a story which is not theirs. So that's why, actually, there are a lot of contradiction, according to him. But as you see, a totally different conception here. She says she accepted people, not because they did not contradict themselves, but that she believed them fully. And she, not, she knows, yes, okay, we're not there to do charity, but, but she, she says, I tell myself, okay, I may be making a mistake, but at least I can make a mistake for someone who has a miserable life anyways. So again, I do approve this there's protection. And finally, what is the best way to assess credibility? For example, board, the, the board has several documents which, which trains the board members. To, to assess credibility. But not in a single place they define what credibility is, or how, what credibility assessment is. But obviously, there are ways to do that. And it, and it is done differently. And board members do know what they are doing, and they know what the others are doing, and why they avoid what, what the others are doing. For example, in this one, the board member explains how what they are supposed to do is, I mean, they're trying, they're doing an investigation, they restitch what the claimant says. Uh, he does the other thing as the board, board member who sometimes proceeds like a police or like a dictator, and that's not the way to do it. And but for, for, for someone who, whose style is interrogation, will say there are some board members who would accept anyone who would who solved a little. If it were just some tears, then the easy to be accepted by them. So that how does how does this happen in an administrative tribunal, which is which is which is an environment very much saturated by law, right? As I said, hearing style is actually a form of victimization. It's a way to decrease the complexity of the work and to find a way to conduct the work. And I said it's based on three conceptions about professional duties, the refugee definition, and the best way, best way to assess credibility. So board members act within a space of legitimized discretion, right? So I argue it's not the individual bias, it's not the political patronage or political control. 
control actually just the endogenous conditions of the organization, which creates this interview and interrogation, which result in major social inequities for the refugee claimants. So I call these, these factors organizational dynamics. <coughs> so first of all, when board members are appointed to the board, most of them are not scientists, they are experts. They become experts through training. After receiving two months of intensive training and then continuous education, they become experts. On the one and and they uh, as they, they are employed at the at the board, obviously they're computing institutional lawyers. So what is the job of the board member? Is it to identify people who need protection, or is it actually to identify people who are trying to pass themselves as refugees? And further, to dip it, this creates a relative goal every week. What is the job of the board member? And further, during the training, there are two, again, two competing, I would say, concepts are very apparent. On the one hand, among the training document, training material, I just underlined that the, the, the determination of refugee status is quite sensitive. The memories, memories are very fluid, people will not be able to remember everything, and the benefit of doubt should be given to the claimant, and all these nice, bubbly, beautiful, sensitive things. But on the other hand, this belief is very, very much present. It's not even suspicion, this belief. <coughs> for example, in the training documents, one, for, for, for example, just did this, the board members are taught how to present the hearing through mock hearings, right? So they, everyone plays a role, a claimant, a lawyer, a board member. And then afterwards, they have to write a decision, an analysis of the decision. So I went through documents for the last 15 years, and one claim file of a gender persecution file from Hungary, a Romani ethnicity, was used again and again and again and again. And it's a, it's a, it's a, negative, it's a negative decision, and the claimant is pulled apart during the hearing and during the, during the writing the analysis as well. So in that sense, these two are very, these two stand side by side. So the board members have to find a way to conceive their role and do something about it. Secondly, being a board member is hard. It's not an easy job. Day in and day out, five times a week, you have to hear stories uh, of persecution, stories of trauma, stories of rape, all these things. And, and they have to, as board members, they have to balance pressures from, that comes from the claimants, that comes from the lawyers, who will create some issues, as well as their superiors to hear more and more cases. So in that sense, they have to find an institutionally acceptable way to do this job. And this, I believe, is the hearing style. And finally, there are very clear demands for speed, efficiency, and consistency. The board adopted, for example, jurisprudential guides, guidelines, and process of decisions, which, which try to increase the consistency of decision making. For example, the jurisprudential, but what is interesting is guidelines do have a very liberal spirit and understanding towards the claimants, but jurisprudential guides and process of decisions are most of the time negative all the time, actually, negative decisions. And they are not mandat mandatory to follow. The board members, again, have the discretion to follow them or not. But if they don't, they have to explain why they don't. And finally, despite these demands from the side of the management, it's not, and even if board members did all the decisions as they, sorry, if they did as many decisions as they were expected to do and delivered the, the analysis and the refugee decision during the time that was assigned to them to do, they still have employment, uh, employment sec security. They, did unemployment, they do not have the employment security. 
because all, all the board members said, like that I spoke for a long period of time, your performance did not, did not matter to be reappointed. So, and the fact that they, they see themselves as the, as the legitimate decision-making authority, they, they avoid it following these demands of consistency. So finally, as a conclusion, so understanding administrative behavior actually is not limited to ideology or individual bias or just the expertise of the claimant. But we have to understand the larger context. So in that sense, governance of a migration, like refugee determination is within, within migration, is a screening and filtering issue and how it is done matters. So as I already told you, the assessment procedures huh, that through hearing styles actually do lead to major inequities for the refugee claimants. Uh, in my future research, I'll look at all types of administrative hearings that include migration disputes, such as uh, admissibility hearings, detention reviews, uh, removal hearings. And so through that lens, which can actually give us uh, a prism of, of practice of rights, actually. How, how international, yes, we do have international human rights, but how do, they, how do they look like in practice? How do they look like in action? And how are they employed, negotiated, or challenged to migration disputes? That's all, thank you. Okay, I'll leave it to you to field questions directly. Sure. And if no one is leaping in, let me ask the first one. Uh, given the variability yes. in behavior of uh, board members, is there a way you would suggest modifying the training, mm -hmm. uh, either to make expectations clearer, to, to equip people with more explicit guidance, <coughs> but uh, could training be improved and thereby bring this variation under control, or is it beyond the capacity of training to influence? I think training could play a role if it is, if, if this issues of sensitivity and disbelief are not underlying <coughs> equally. For example, I'm, I'm, I mean, obviously the, the suspicion is going to stay there. As, as Canada, as other refugee receiving countries, will not be able to accept all claims. That, that, is, that is as simple as that. So in that sense, suspicion will remain. And, and the board members will have to differentiate between, between claims exactly that have, that have a well-founded fear of persecution or not. But still, training can be modified in a way that is for example, they can use different claim files instead of using the same claim file, which raises a few issues and incoherencies, and then that it, it is completely uh, dismissed as, a, as an unfounded claim, for example. Do you think maybe if they added to the training like a component where they analyze the consequences of sending someone back to their country, mm -hmm. for example, do you think that would make them a little bit more sympathetic? Because, I mean, just standing there as a fellow human being and trying to judge whether or not someone deserves protection, that's kind of like a godlike decision that you're making. I was just kind of shocked that that was like the main question. So, do you think they even like consider it? Or are they just doing their job? Like, I don't even no, I, I do I do think they do consider it. But what is funny is what I noticed the more a board member worked there, the more they were alienated almost from the issue. For example, one which I will never forget, one explained to me how when he first was appointed at the board, he put a quote from Anne Frank on his desk, which said uh, something like okay, where am I going to hide myself? Like, there's no home, there's nothing, what am I going to do? And he said, my colleagues would just pass through my office and they would laugh at me. And then I would, I would, I would think, what kind of people are they? They're, they're heartless, how they can laugh at what Anne Frank said? Well, how can they laugh at what, what the refugees went through? And he's this 
someone who was saying, uh, I was a refugee myself, I'll tell my story in the, in the same way a hundred times. But then he said, after a while, when I noticed that the claimants were actually lying, that's his perception, professional and personal perception of the situation, then he was like, and I understood actually there was no Anne Frank coming to Canada. Yeah, but Anne, Anne Frank was a human being. She's not some goddess. <laughs> like, how can you just decide whether someone deserves to live here? Like, I just think the whole system is absolutely corrupt. Like, no one person should just have the power to decide that. Before it was two people on the other side, it was two people deciding. And when one decision maker agreed that that person was a refugee, that was it. So they did not have to agree on, on the need for protection. But now it's just one. Uh, adding on to the point you said, Abba, it would be difficult to completely eliminate bias because in the case of the, the board member who was my family to refugee refugees themselves. It's impossible for him to leave that experience out of his judgment. It's always going to haunt him. It's always going to, if he has a, a certain idea of what a refugee looks like, mm -hmm. he can't develop an, a different idea. And the only problem is, if you have a policy that's too harsh and you're just kicking people out, it's bad. But if you have a policy where you, you're kind of you're letting emotional biases come creep in and you're just being more lenient, you're also creating an incentive. To be, for people to take advantage of, the, of that system, and then you're going to allow people who aren't refugees to take advantage of it by being lenient and being so. It, it, it's it's a lot more difficult for someone to, to judge someone who's in that position because yeah, it, it would be terrible if they were being heartless and and being uh, purely uh, removed from emotion. But if they begin to let their emotions come in, that'll cloud their judgment, and then other people will take advantage. Of it. Well, I mean that's one of the one of the, the arguments the the ones who interrogated made all the time. It's like no, the other board members who allow their emotions to get in, and that they do not. This is a strictly legal bureaucratic work. They do not understand that. But it is even if we claim that there is no emotions involved. Of course, there are emotions involved. How can they not be? I mean, someone is describing you what they went through in the, in the detention last few months, how they were how they were continuously raped, how, how they were uh, beaten several times. So no board member actually, despite the fact that they said, no, this is actually street illegal work, they all said they were impacted by the stories they were told. I just, I, I, I want to clarify from an immigration position, yeah. because I'm a former senior immigration officer, and there has to be distinctions made between, between professional and, and, and patronage appointment. There has to be, you know? Uh, and that distinction is blurred here. When you call, you know, I'm going to be a little harsh, when you call the board members professional, mm -hmm. I mean, the system is really based on a, a, a it's a community-based social good or, or nation building uh, uh, framework that, that, is, that is in place, which is different from a professional expert framework. Mm -hmm. Immigration is made up of professional experts, people who worked for 30 years, who worked in immigration offices abroad. They know the kinds of, mm -hmm. uh, of, 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 of trauma that people have in life that you were mentioning. And they, that kind of experience is built up over years. So to put somebody in, uh, let me use the example of the professor. You cannot train somebody for two months mm -hmm. and then make them a professor, you know, and have them, expect them to have competent and uh, a comprehensive decision. So it's not like, like uh, 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 how can you make the decision of who gets in the country, but who is really in a position to make that decision? Mm -hmm. So therefore, it goes back to this argument that it's long-standing. Should we have a community-based system based with amateurs <laughs> in place, 
or should you professionalize the system and, and, and turn it back to immigration again and let immigration do hearings at the board, you know, to, to, to resolve the same decision, those of you who know immigration and know what I'm talking about. Because if you do if you do the refugee hearings at the border, then you can have professionals take over the system and eliminate some of this variability, I think. I'm, I'm actually not asking a question, am I? <laughs> I'm kind of talking. But maybe the question should be, uh, there's a couple questions that I have, mm -hmm. would you expect difference in examining uh, detention hearings and removal hearings, mm -hmm. which are conducted by experienced immigration professionals yeah. and board members at the, the IRB? You know? And secondly, I want to ask you, would, what do you think about, say, resolving these variability problems by, by having a, a professional system. Mm -hmm. Some people advocate for a professional uh, expert system rather than this community basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's start with, with the first one. So instead of a lay person's tribunal in this community system, it's talk about a professional system. So the fact that I mean, the, the, the Refugee Protection Division, which does refugee determinations, has been the public servant framework. Now they're employed for life, and they had to pass an exam and then interviews to be employed now at the board. But again, when we look at their decisions, again, there's a lot of inconsistency. So one argument was, one argument was, while transforming the system, was actually, since they will have job security, they will take more independent decisions according to their own judgment and instead of the instead of having these ideas of okay I have to follow the political political will of the current government so that maybe I can be reappointed like this arguments. But again I mean where where there is discretion even if it is a professional system if one doctor doctor A and doctor B does not diagnose and treat in the same way. And uh, again in other other kinds of, uh, one teacher will not teach the same like the other, one lawyer's methods will not be the same as the others. So in that sense, discretion will always remain, even if it is, even if it is professionalized. So, the, the, so it is up to, I guess, more to sociologists to study what actually, what social factors do impact one's professional, one's choice of their professional identity, for example. And in terms of detention and detention and removal hearings, right? I actually there I, I more want to look at not just the board member, but to the to the interaction to study the the, the, the hearing as a social legal site where both state actors, non-state actors, and non-citizens do come together and not necessarily discuss, but but adjudicate what is what is going on. So it's a very much a project that this that this in infancy. So I would love to get your comments on that later. Yeah. Is there any questions? What role will the board members play in the the mass Syrian refugee acceptance? And uh, what uh, role did they play in the mass uh, in other mass acceptances like? Uh, uh, expulsion of South Asians from Uganda? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, like, like the, the Syrian refugees at least cannot come to Canada like they can't get to Europe, right? So in that sense, what is going to happen, like what uh, Justin Trudeau has explained, like how many refugees from Syria that we're going to bring, it's not the board members who are going to take those decisions, but it's actually immigration officials around Syria who are going to who are going to do the screening and filtering and then decide if these people are refugees. So the board members are not really playing a role on on making decisions of asylum seekers who are going to be settled from abroad. So I know uh, people who are part of the. South Asian, you got that expulsion, 
and uh, uh, what I heard, what I know from that is that uh, Canada sent in one of its uh, military cargo planes, mm -hmm. and people were just told to go on board. Yeah. So I don't know. Was there screening there, or there must be a minimum of screening to, I mean, to at least to clarification of the identity. Who these people are, right? That period, there wasn't a refugee. Yeah. There was only immigration. Immigration uh, actually controlled that pro whole process. They're actually going to control the, the, the current process, too. But uh, it, it, there was no determination by mm -hmm. refugees. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I'm drawing from my own personal experience being on the board for a brief mm -hmm. time. Um, but to the point in terms of professionalizing the decision makers and so on, um, in Canada we have a judicial appointment process, and you have had to be you have to go to law school and practice for ten years before you can apply for a position on the, on the courts. But then it becomes politicized because then the appointment has to go to the attorney general or the minister of justice at the federal level, and then they appoint the person. In Europe, though, the system is very different. In Europe, you go to law school, and then it branches off. You either go continue on your training, and you get advanced training at university in a judicial college as a judge, or you go off in terms of doing practice. Are you saying that all, all the board members are lawyers, are they? No, they're not. A certain percentage have to be lawyers by law, but they're not all lawyers. But my point simply is we could go to the European model in terms of adjudicating or judges in general. And you know, to become a judge, you have to actually have the formal training and be professionalized. And then move up the ranks, the instances of the court system, and there's probably ongoing training as well that goes on because you could be a first instance decision maker deciding on the basis of facts, and then you're a decision maker on, on the basis of appeal, and the appeal level goes higher and higher, of course, in terms of it. Um, but related, this, this sort of covers both points to some degree in terms of David's point, could you improve the training somehow? Interestingly enough, the Immigration and Refugee Board is considered to have one of the best training systems mm -hmm. of any administrative tribunal. Have you ever and been in the immigration office, James? I can talk to you this way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. You but haven't been they, in the immigration it's been, it's been <laughs> recognized as It's always as struck having. me as, as, as totally bizarre that people who would, who would be on these tribunals and, be, and recognize themselves as experts have no, and have no knowledge of the immigration system whatsoever, have never been in the immigration office. But the philosophy in terms of the board when it was first established, it's not the same way uh, it, as Shuley's pointed out now because the RPD is completely bureaucratized. Yeah. And the great criticism yeah. of the RPD right now, or one of the criticisms from the advocacy community is they're in a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So they're being supervised. Yeah. And the relationship between superior and subordinate is very important. So if your manager is influencing you either directly or indirectly in terms of your decision making, that's bias. <laughs> so we have concerns about having a system that is bureaucratized, that operates within a hierarchy. And if you're a decision maker and you have to report to a supervisor and that supervisor is directing you in terms of deciding claims a particular way, then that's not as fair as a system made up of lay, lay individuals that are representative of Canada. Canada, the IRB was considered to have one of the most diverse decision making bodies administratively of anything in the Canadian government. And it didn't matter what your age was, and it didn't matter what your professional background was. Well, the the minimum requirement cost, was a, it's, was it's a it's undergraduate in place, It's cost Canadian citizens like me and other people in this room $30 billion because of the IRB. Well, maybe over the, the lifespan of the over IRB. Over the lifespan, yeah, yeah, but, because but $2 billion a year. But the point, the argument let me was, ask you about this model. What would you think about a model where you actually have immigration officers at the border, senior immigration officers, conduct oral hearings there? 
Uh, well, they do in terms of eligibility to claim. No, no, I mean, but resolving the claims like they used to. They pre, used to have incredible the basis decision. hearings. Yeah, absolutely. Pre I mean, the Singh decision, senior immigration officers actually made the determinations of our, our well, the, it's the Refugee order. Status Advisory Board, and we had a, a much different process at that time. But your general point, I understand your argument, and it, there has been an ongoing debate in terms of should it be professionalized or should it be a lay body that's representative? Because deciding refugee claims, the argument is, shouldn't be that complicated. Yeah. And it's something that you can develop an expertise on. Obviously, you know, you can't do instantly RSD, refugee status determination. It takes some training. It takes a period of time before you can actually preside at a hearing. They don't throw you into very difficult cases when you first start. You build up a capacity to be able to adjudicate more, more difficult cases. So there is a process internally in terms of bringing people along. They told me when I first started at the board, it's going to take you two years to learn this job. I sort of laughed at that. Two years? Are you kidding me? I've got a PhD. I've been teaching at university for years. It's going to take me two years to learn how to adjudicate a claim. You know what? They were absolutely right. It takes two years before you're fully trained. So uh, yeah, there's a very intensive two-month training program for everyone in terms of orientation, in terms of the process and everything else. But to get to the capacity where you can do all sorts of claims in all sorts of situations, no. That takes ongoing effort. The reason why it's considered to be one of the most, I, I guess, proficient in terms of training, I, I don't know what it's done at CSC, but they have monthly professional development days. They have, in addition, a half day of training for each of the teams. And the law, as you know, um, Lauren, the law is ever changing. It's not fixed. You can, even lawyers are required in terms of professional development hours to maintain your license. You have to have ongoing training. Like most professions, you have to have ongoing training because the law changes. The courts issue judgments all the time. Part of the monthly training that all adjudicators get, including, incidentally, tribunal officers and staff, is a review of the most important judgments that come out of every instance of the court system. And it's reviewed by legal counsel, identifying not only the ratio descendant of each judgment, but also the obiter and everything else, how the cases relate to previous cases before. Because if you're not abreast of the jurisprudence, then you don't understand the law. In every profession I know, there are thresholds. You know, when, when we were in sociology, we had to do a BA, mm -hmm. we had to do an MA, mm -hmm. and then we did a PhD. Right? And then we consider ourselves expert. I, I, I'm sure you agree with that process. Yeah. In an immigration context, it's always been, until the IRB, that you had the same kind of benchmark. You would, you would work your, your way up and to become an immigration officer. You could become an entry officer. You would work at the airport. You would work at various, in various capacities in the system. And then you could become, write your exam to become an immigration officer. And then you could work your way up and eventually become a senior immigration officer. Right. And then when you become a senior immigration officer, you would be able to have enough experience and expertise to be able to conduct refugee hearings. Mm -hmm. That takes more than two years, my friend. Yeah. In the same yeah. way that becoming a sociologist takes more than two years. Yeah. I and mean, that is what I would determine, or the equivalent to what I would call a professionalized system. Mm -hmm. Everything else is simply a lay system I, I, that's, I'm not that's, that's that, contradictory right? because it's tried to be, they try to put it in a professionalized context. But we are moving to that, as yeah. Julie has said. The RPD now is entirely bureaucratized. But the criticism is, even under that kind of a formal training system, if you have senior managers that are reviewing your judgments or directing you implicitly, it is not a independent decision-making process. That is one of the major criticisms of the U.S. asylum system. It is all immigration officers that are permanently appointed that have to report to supervisors. And there is a subtle relationship that goes on between your supervisor and yourself in terms of adjudication. 
You're not a completely independent decision maker. That's the argument. Mm -hmm. But my question actually, Shuli, is one of the points that she mm -hmm. raised with respect to uncertain employment security, mm -hmm. which is very different from a permanent civil service where you have security of tenure, et cetera. And not having security of tenure, do you think that adds an element in terms of bias for the adjudicator? Because sometimes it's argued, all right, you're appointed by the liberals, your appointment is initially for three years, and the second year, the government changes, it's now a conservative government, is suddenly the decision makers swing their judgments because they know the reappointment is going to be contingent on the new Minister of Citizenship and Immigration and now refugees, I guess, who is going to determine their fate in terms of the reappointment. In other words, decision makers consciously or unconsciously because of the uncertainty in terms of employment, that is, they're not tenured, they're subject to renewal and reappointment, Will they decide in favor of whatever ideology or, or partisanship or political preference of the government is in? And we say in terms of administrative tribunals, of course, one of the w reasons why they do not have security of tenure in terms of administrative theory is the government can then actually shape public policy along its platform that was democratically, hopefully, elected to public office. So it becomes more responsive to the public. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, in a, a quasi-judicial setting, which the IRB is in, having no security tenure actually promotes this kind of inconsistency, either, again, unconsciously or consciously on the part of judiciary. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe so. All the members that I spoke to told me that for, from the beginning that they were appointed to the IRB, they knew, most most of the ones, I would say, which only one had a political affiliation, a strong political affiliation with the liberals, they all said they knew they were not going to be reappointed again. And, but some of them are actually reappointed again. Again, so, so some of them stayed over 10 years, and they are still hearing cases for, for like they, they have the contracts for, for 90 day contracts, right? They still want to be given. So as, as they knew that whatever they did, did I don't want to say whatever they did, whatever decisions they did did not matter, but their performance in terms of taking more consistent decisions or following what the government would want them to do was not going to make a difference in their appointment. So they said, I actually did when I, I decided the cases according to my own judgment, not really thinking that they want me to accept or refuse more claims. Okay, I see that uh, there is migration of our audience uh, <laughs> underway, and I should formally draw this to a, to a close before uh, uh, the critical mass gets too low. People who want to continue informally with Julie, I'm sure will be able to do so. Let me just formally draw this to a conclusion by presenting you with this token of our appreciation. This has become one of the most coveted items at York University because it cannot be purchased. It can only be received for giving us off here at McLaughlin College. So thank you very much. And if any of you want to carry on the discussion, please do.